goes. Well, everybody, I'm coming on now and joining us on Facebook, and uh, we're always excited to, to get together with people all over the world. I wanted to welcome you again to the Resonance Academy's six-week overview of our Unified Science program, which we made available a couple of weeks ago for free. And uh, my name is Marshall Lethwitz, as you heard, and I'm a member of the Academy and a member of the Resonance Science Foundation. And I'm here with, of course, Ms. Hermain, who is our uh, Resonance Science Foundation's founder and director of research. And um, this, this six week series is being offered to provide an introduction to the course and for Nassim to share about the subjects of each of the six modules that are in the course. Uh, and we're going to cover one module per week. And I just wanted to reiterate that it's not the purpose of this for everybody to study a module each week and be prepared for this, uh, this session. It's, uh, you don't have to feel like you have to keep pace. You can if you want. That's great but it's, it's not the purpose of these. This is really just to be an introductory overview of these different modules for people who are just coming into it or not familiar of, uh, with it as yet. Um, and so we're in our second week of the six week series of these live webinars. And uh, I mean, I'm excited to say that I understand there's over 5,000 people who have signed up for this particular series that have come into the, to the course. And so we're really about that. And today, we're going to share an overview of module two, which is called Thinking Differently. Um, and before we dive into that, I also do want a little bit, of, again, a little more intro of the course itself. But before we do that, I wanted to welcome you in the sim and have you say hi and just give a little short, just a little. Hi, everybody. <laughs> that was Did, you <laughs> Did you say 15,000? 5,000 is what I heard have signed up for this series. And uh -huh. then I don't yeah. know the number that have come into the course itself. Yeah, so we have about 15,000 people taking the course right now. Um, so that's really wonderful and exciting. And, you know, there's discussions going on on the forum that are interesting, even though I don't necessarily answer um, uh, because I'm too busy right now, but um, I'm really excited. I'm really enthusiastic to see all these uh, questions and discussions going on. And, and um, as well, uh, it's really um, um, wonderful to, wa to watch the transformation in, um, in people when they start to get this kind of information into their consciousness, into their awareness. And I've been working on physics with Olivier uh, Erol, our doctor in physics that uh, works with us. Um, and um, we're doing some really cool stuff right now. And it's been really exciting because it's, um, you know, when I do these physics, when I work on this kind of stuff, um, although I have, um, you know, a path forward that has been clearly um, uh, successful in, throughout the years, meaning that like I made early assumptions, um, discoveries based on uh, geometric structures, based on simple mathematics and, you know, and descriptions of physics and the relationship of the physics with the geometry. And then I eventually wrote equations that started to describe, first of all, like a torque in space time and all this, but, and then eventually um, the quantization of the structure of space and its information transfer across the boundary of an event horizon, a very geometric and uh, algebraic approach. And now we're um, going to the next level and scaling it to all the different scales in the universe. And it's been very, very, um, how do you say, um, 
uh, fruitful in the last few weeks when you see the kind of concepts um, that were becoming illuminated as I uh, worked on the physics, like just emerging in, in, its, in their full glory in the physics. And so I'm, uh, I'm excited for today um, and I'm looking forward to talking about module two, which is about thinking differently. And, um, you know, and, uh, and the history of different thinkers and how that might have been difficult for uh, some of them to uh, be able to bring their stuff forward. Um, and, and as well, like, it, I think that module for me, what it does the best is that it, it starts to give me an idea of, um, you know, the challenges that can happen in trying to bring new information forward and how to be able to decipher, you know, if, uh, if a model has validity or not. And uh, I think that's really interesting. It sure is. And it's very relevant to our times as well, uh -huh. uh, as it has been over many centuries. <laughs> yes. At times like these. Um, great. Well, before we do that, I just changed my location. Hopefully my proximity to the uh, router is going to be a little better than it was before. Yeah, so, it improved a lot. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to just share my screen and take a quick look at that at the module again and the overview of it. And I uh, also want to say if you do have questions related to this module, ideally, um, you can or to the topic of thinking differently. There's the Q&A link at the bottom of the screen where you can put your questions. And if you could just keep your questions to uh, subjects related to the, to the course and to the topic, that would be great. Um, we, we're not gonna be answering logistical questions or support questions or other kinds of questions in these sessions in that uh, particular Q&A section there. Um, but go ahead and put some questions in there if you want. I see some coming in now and we'll get to that in a little bit. And then you can also put your comments in the chat. I know a lot of people are already saying hi from all over the world. And um, if you have other comments as we're discussing this, you can put comments in there and then questions in the Q&A. Uh, so real quick, I'm just gonna share my screen. And here's the module two, which is thinking differently. And again, if you're new to this, um, there's the first page that you come into is where you can really uh, access all of the sections within a given module. And so here we are in module two, there's always an introduction. So the topics in this, the, the large topics are the courage to be bold because it actually takes courage to think differently and to go up against the, the forces that are pretty entrenched in a, in a current way of thinking that's you know, a scientific worldview or even a spiritual one or societal. And sometimes it takes a lot of courage, which I know Nassim can talk to uh, a little bit in his experience. <clears throat> and there actually is a, a, a part of these sections where Nassim does talk about his experience. Then there's the section on different thinkers uh, and the roots of scientific ideas for better or worse and how over the course of our, our recorded history have been, you know, the, those who have really led the thinking of the times and the thinking that has informed the times going forward, again, for better or worse, meaning was it a accurate assessment and description of nature and the universe? Was it mis misunderstood and therefore um, causing confusion? Um, how were they, challenged and in some cases very severely suppressed, et cetera. Um, and then there's Nassim's personal story of thinking differently as a part of this section. And then the principles of thinking differently, which we can take a look at these a little bit more as we get through the overview here. Um, and then kind of the heart of it is the shift from what we call a 2D isolation model, um, which is, really been driving the, the, the 
kind of the basis of physics and science in general for a long time. And when you switch to then a holographic wholeness model and actually a holofractal model, um, what a big difference in thinking and the perspective it, it uh, provides uh, when we do that. So those are the, um, the big buckets in this one. It's a very, very important topic. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, I'll just remind everybody that there, again, there is the forum here where you can introduce yourselves and um, go into each of the modules and ask questions or make comments and other areas to add different kinds of information or ask questions. So check it all out. I'll stop my share. So, um, so Nassim, thinking differently has been kind of your driving force for 30 to 40 years. I know yeah. I've been doing that as well. And, and you know, we've been doing it in our different ways, but we converge into our, our love and passion of the, the science, the physics, the geometry, and how you know, it's really important for that to inform our world and our worldview, as we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking differently is really kind of where it begins and being willing to, and as the first section is called the courage to think differently. Right. So maybe we can be begin there and you can just touch into some of your experience and the courage it's taken you to, to persevere and keep banging on the doors that don't want to be opened. And they're opening, but it takes right. a lot of banging. So, Well, yeah, it takes a lot of, it's <laughs> unbelievable. But, I, you know, it's, it's normal. I think in general, you know, what goes on is that... Um, it, it's often the change is so alien to the um, to the to the accepted status quo or paradigm in which it's being delivered, right? That it's very challenging, can be very challenging to to start experiencing the world that way. Right. Um, so, so you have a very clear worldview, and we discussed worldview last week. You know, and all of a sudden, it gets completely, you know, thrown to pieces and redone um, from a different perspective. And um, it's it can be very challenging. For instance, um, just practically, uh, imagine a physicist that has worked at his or hers all life, you know, on developing and understanding the theories of physics that have been taught for, you know, hundreds of years or a hundred years or whatever, how long that the specific theory they're studying is. And, you know, they span most of their life, in some cases, 50 years, 60 years of their life, you know, exploring that viewpoint, exploring the theory and moving the theory forward. Um, and even in very small increments, because in general, the, the theories that were written 100 years ago um, are still standing. Um, so the all of a sudden, to observe um, the universe or to experience the universe or to to, um, to transform a certain formalism to a completely different one is, is, can be difficult and painful and, um, and it's understandable. And that's why, you know, it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of uh, courage for somebody to even um, have an inkling towards it to, to explore it, to start thinking about it, to talk to others about it, you know, it takes takes courage, and um, it really um, it requires as well a lot of empathy, and that's one thing I learned throughout the years. You see, I I used to really go against um, the grain, and and I would get really furious, <laughs> you know, in some cases. Um, it was very difficult. There was very difficult conversations that were happening between me and other physicists and scientists in general. And, you know, in, 
in physics conferences, you know, in many different interactions. Um, yeah, I just couldn't seem to bring, you know, the, the points I was making forward in a way that was um, understandable to them, never mind acceptable. So it was very difficult. And um, you, I, and I realized in one very specific instance in which I was in a physics conference at the university in Nebraska, I believe. And uh, we were in a private conference where the media was not allowed in for, and, and that had been set up that way so that people would be comfortable. And, um, and we were almost for five days, I believe, or four days in this, in this little room with some of the best mathematicians and physicists. Um, and uh, we, you know, were working it out or, and, and um, there was difficult conversation that started early in the, con in, in the conference. And um, there was a very important moment where uh, the physicist in the room that had the, that he was fairly, elderly, he had a lot of experience, I'm not going to name him, but um, he, it, the person was, it was basically my direct opponent. <laughs> we, we sat at opposite side of the table and, you know, there was fairly heated moments throughout the days. And um, at one point um, in uh, his a presentation of the, the theory he was working with, which um, was um, very, uh, I, I believe, very in the correct direction um, as it defined space time in terms of, um, of um, information uh, structures. But, and I was able to show while he was presenting a, um, a correlation between his theory and mine. And, you know, the thing kind of like opened up and uh, all of a sudden tears came, you know, down uh, this person's cheek because um, they realized um, that we were not in opposition, but that we were helping each other or that the theories at least were compatible. and. Um, you know, it was it was a big moment for me because I realized that um, you, how difficult it must be to work for, in this case, like some 65 years on something specific and um, be challenged by something else that comes along. And, um, and that is part of the courage to think differently. It's it's being open to the possibilities. It's being open to not only that the, po the possibilities that what is known is not complete or it needs changes or fundamental changes, um, but as well open to what you're doing, um, having things that need more completion as well. That, like, you have to have the flexibility and that takes courage as well to be able to like reassess how you, how you got there and, you know, um, and, and, and the validity of your approach. So it, it, it's kind of different levels of courage. Um, and, um, and at the same time, there's a level of knowing this is not well known in science, <laughs> you know, um, because it's not described, although most of the greatest scientists that made huge discoveries, you know, had this sense of knowing and they talked about it, um, you know, before they found the proof. Um, there is as well this sense of knowing and, and to a certain extent, you got to trust this so that you can actually explore in a certain direction. Um, and it might turn out as it typically does that it's 
not quite exactly what you thought, but um, and uh, it, it, it's it, it requires an effort, courage to you know explore this sense, and that's not something that's well you know um, that's encouraged in our institution. That's one of the problems. It's um, you know it's not encouraged to get creative in um, in thinking differently. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and it does take courage to follow those those breadcrumbs, as we even talk about in the in the mm -hmm. module, uh, where they may lead, right or wrong, and mm -hmm. and especially then to put yourself out there in the community of scientists with a new idea that you feel good about. You have some sense that it's valid, but you may not have gone far enough to really validate it. And I know in your early years, that was, you know, very much what you were pushing up against. Right. Uh, you've got a lot of validation now, but it takes a lot of courage to, to do those initial steps. And of course, getting then the backlash and right. the hammering that comes, which you've experienced, but we also have in the, uh, in the module is the, the, the different thinkers and um, the roots Which, of these scientific ideas and what they faced in advancing right. thoughts and the, and the, the exactly. paradigms of science. Uh, you wanna just speak to that a little bit? Well, you know, we could go a little bit one by one, but um, basically, um, yeah, I mean, in my case, I'm still experiencing uh, quite a bit of it. I, you know, I've been censored. Uh, I've been, you know, I'm still censored um, uh, on different sites, including Wikipedia. You know, yeah. but yeah. you know, uh, and so um, that's okay. I, the last uh, women Nobel Prize was a Canadian um, uh, physicist that um, that just got the Nobel Prize two years ago, and she couldn't get a she was censored on Wikipedia as well um, wow. till the day after she got the Nobel Prize and then they quickly put the, a page up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so I guess, you know, I'm in good company, um, but um, it, it's, it makes it difficult to bring the information out. It makes it difficult. This is, this is not, should not be a part of science, right? It, 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 it makes it, difficult for other physicists to be able to comment on your ideas and help you move forward and move forward altogether. You know, the, the fact that you're not able to communicate or that there's an attempt at stopping you from communicating with the rest of the scientific po uh, population for various, you know, underlying reasons is just should not be accepted in physics. It's, it's, it should be. Yeah unacceptable or in any science. I mean, the, yeah. it's critical that, you know, people can assess concepts and if they turned out to be completely false or wrong, it, it will emerge from the, from the work that people are doing on it and we're all gonna learn, right? That, that's the whole idea. Um, and so, you know, but that resistance I was talking about earlier exists. And uh, certainly many of these people um, experienced it. So if you look at 2.3.1, you know, you got Pythagoras, you know, Plato, Euclid. Um, so in the case of Pythagoras, um, Pythagoras was like, first of all, clearly educated in some esoteric knowledge that um, he, we, first of all, we know very little about Pythagoras because most of it was lost when his school uh, was burnt to the ground and all the documents and all this was lost, but as well, which was <laughs> the pushback at the time, it was, it was more brutal than, you know, than a few nasty comments <laughs> on your Facebook page. Um, but um, as well, um, 
you know, it, but it was known that he had been taught by Egyptian high priests, you know, that he had studied with the Egyptian and so on. And is clearly um, his doctrine of, of geometry, uh, of the structure of space, uh, of, um, of uh, oscillation in space, right? Uh, he had very clearly related musical or oscillating systems with geometric system. Um, and, um, and his conclusion of a very fundamental geometry of space that initiated with a uh, tetrasect that was the tetrahedral uh, structure of space time that he called the, the sacred, you know, the sacred um, uh, uh, fundamental brick of creation, basically, um, I think was very, very valid and very, very strong. And it, 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 it opened the whole possibility for humanity. And that possibility, it's like a little flame that came up, you know, in the history of humanity where, where humanity could, could have diverged right in that moment, right? Humanity could have gone to that direction and most likely would have advanced very quickly from these fundamental concepts. They're, they're not so far-fetched relative to, you know, string theory and, um, you know, um, uh, quant uh, 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 quantum loop theory and, and so on, many other theories um, that, and, and even Einstein field equations, which, you know, geometry, space-time, uh, and so on. And so, like, it could have taken a turn, but that little flame was distinguished <laughs> with a big flame. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, and, and a lot of the information was lost until Plato, which kind of pulls it out um, as a result of connection with his father and all this, getting the information and then exploring that information himself and leading to, you know, very interesting concept um, that eventually, you know, like concept even that the earth is round, that, uh, that uh, Plato already had in his, in his thesis. And, uh, and, um, and, and, and again, a very great opportunity for humanity to diverge again and, and an opportunity for, for a whole new approach to the world, a whole new worldview, a whole new understanding to emerge uh, based on fundamental geometric concept, the structure of space-time and oscillations. And, um, and then again, you know, this, um, uh, this loss, you know, the, 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 the miscomprehension of, of uh, Plato's doctrines, including, uh, and that just as a sideline, including his two tomes on Atlantis, right? Uh, his two tomes on the, uh, describing an earlier civilization that he had learned about from the high priests in Egypt that's supposed to have been there and that had very advanced knowledge, including this geometric approach and all this. So even a divergence in there of the history of humanity could have occurred, but it uh, didn't emerge. It, it, it didn't make it. And then eventually to Euclid, and I'm not going to go through all of them because it's, you know, we don't have time, but, uh, and I want to take questions, but, um, but basically you get all of a sudden, you know, a, 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 the, the start of the concepts of, of, um, of um, uh, a geometrization of space that, um, that introduces um, conceptual math that, um, that, um, that gives a linear function to geometry, right? Euclidean planes and, and these kind of things that um, eventually will be used in modern physics to explain different phenomena. 
and there there's now a division that happens you know in which um some a, a certain con certain concepts that have to do with volumes and the structure of volume is lost um and um and the tendency is to uh to have remove that from our understanding of physics so that we can simplify everything to two-dimensional you know planes minkowski's uh, planes and 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 these kind of artificial models uh conceptual models uh mathematical models to express physics which is fine as long as you don't forget that you've made a model if you forgot you made a model, then you get you get in trouble when you apply it to physics because you assume that the physics of the universe are obeying your model. And I, I, you know, so I could say a lot about this, um, and I don't want to get too far and too lost, but I, I'd like to address, for instance, the the later guys on the list, you know. Um, uh, um, uh, they, you know, this Kepler, of course, there's, there's Galileo, there's Bruno, you know, all these guys working on the heliocentric uh, solar system, um, you know, that definitely got a lot of rotten tomatoes thrown at them, um, you know, because um, it a was a literal fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By, exactly. In case of Bruno, that was the end of him uh, to have the uh, the audacity to mention that the Earth may not be at the center of our solar system was just not acceptable. And um, and there was a lot of physical evidence to support the geocentric. Uh, solar system a lot and this is why I wanted to mention those guys quickly is because this is what can happen a model can give you the right answers right very good right answers with the first fairly high level of precision and be completely wrong relative to the mechanics of what's actually happening there um, and that's really a big problem. Like people don't realize that um, that can happen. So the, like, you know, the, the younger physicists and so on. Um, um, and, and I think this is what bit them in, in string theory um, is that basically, um, you know, you can, you can make a solar system geocentric and, um, and, uh, and, and have all the planets spinning around the earth and it's just gonna look like a bad hair day, right? It's gonna look like a bad hair day, but you can account for the position of every planet in the solar system with some high level of accuracy, right? Um, and, 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 there is no reason to think that the sun would be anywhere close to the center, right? It's just, you can, and so for somebody to switch the, so, the solar system for the sun to be in the middle and now get the same le level of accuracy, um, you know, then um, it, it's very, very, um, and, you know, it's very, like uh, difficult for people to accept because they're saying we have a model, it's working just fine, and it's given us the right answer. Like we can predict where one of the planets is gonna be, and you know, and and so why would we want to switch? And I'm I'm saying this very, you know, there's more history behind it, but you know, basically, um, this shows you that like. You can have the wrong model and, and make the wrong, have the wrong visual, right? Of what's actually happening in the universe, not understanding what's happening in the universe, but still get the right answer 
because um, because your model cannot like will will still produce the mathematics will still produce the right answer just with the wrong frame of reference. So it it, it um it, and then you get Kepler that comes along, and then that goes oh look at that I can. I can think of the orbitals as frequencies, as sound, like octaves, right? And then I can think of the geometry of the orbital as like literal nested geometry in the in the, uh, in, in here on Earth. Meaning, I I can do this nested geometry on Earth and estimate the orbital of planets and you know, this is remarkable. Now, you know, of course, eventually, you know, it was found that planets have elliptical courses and all this, but the means, the means um, orbit of planets obey these very specific geometric relationship. There's a great book uh, called um, The uh, a little, a little book, of book of Coincidence. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, it's really um, interesting uh, little book that shows you the relationship of the platonic solids and the geometry to the orbitals of our planet and um, uh, our planets in our solar system and, and how well it, it predicts them. Like it's, they're all within 99.9 to 99.8% accurate. So uh, for the means orbit. So it's really, it's really interesting, but again, you know, humanity had a chance to make a diversion there to geometry, to understanding the structure of space and so on, but it didn't take that opportunity. It, um, you know, and, and the result is that we still are missing a fundamental geometric relationship to between space time and quantum theory. So, mm -hmm. you know, that that was for that section. So, so you can imagine, um, you know, um, these guys went through some difficult moments to bring this to the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So, and um, one of the questions that was posed is around the those who have a particular viewpoint that has been established for a long time um, have a survival instinct to maintain that because their identity, their profession, their model is based on that viewpoint. Um, and that's oftentimes the, the, that which poses the conflict when a new uh, way of thinking comes in is just this, the sheer kind of panic of losing one's ground when a certain way, uh, an established way of thinking is becoming obsoleted. And I know that uh, in, in great part, what you are bringing forth with the unified science, unified physics is actually threatening some of what is established uh, models and uh, theories that um, have been <laughs> rigorously pursued and well-funded and still are. And yet by some simple addition of a different way of thinking and bringing in geometric solutions, they actually become obsolete. And right. that's very scary for people. Yep. Uh, that's a big part of the challenge that we're facing is a lot of pushback right. you get from that. Yeah, and, 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 that, and as we were talking about the history, you can see that this moment of actually understanding a geometric, you know, approach to the universe has like come along a few times and, and the door, you know, opened a few times and was slammed shut a few, a few times. Right. And, um, and really the, the largest success in geometrizing the universe was Einstein, right? Which, geometrized space time but got some serious pushback as well you know um of course um in its early days and um and as you but was fortunate enough to have max planck on his side 
uh, helping him publish and so on. And at the time, physics, the physics world was much smaller. Um, and, um, and so basically, you know, there is, um, so, I mean, for when I am talking about geometrizing space-time, people might ask, well, what is he talking about, like the geometry of space-time? Um, you know, this is part of what we're going to discover in this course, is that space and time, first of all, was not defined by Einstein, meaning he, he geometrized it, meaning he got, he got gravity out of it, at the curvature of space-time but he didn't describe what space-time was made of. <laughs> like if it's curving, producing gravity, it must be made of something, right? And so this, this kind of stayed in the air, you know, all this time to this day, right? This like, wait, what is this thing curving? How, so like, it's nice that it produced gravity and gives the right answer, but what is it made of? How did it get there? What is that? Well. You know, in quantum field theory, space and time at the quantum level, at the atomic level, is not empty, it's full of energy. And it's full of energy fluctuating at the Planck scale. And, and that scale is very, very teeny, smaller than the atom. And, it, it, and it's kind of like grainy. So that space time is not smooth, it, it's grainy. And this graininess of space time organized in geometric relationship, just like atoms organize in geometric relationship and make the table of elements, right? Um, molecules, um, you know, or protons are organizing in the nuclei to make elements. And, you know, these elements make molecules and, and the molecules make cells, you know, that are geometrically organized together to make biology. <laughs> And, and so on. And so you, so what I'm saying is that, what I mean by that is that there is, the, there is a background of geometry in all of nature that you can see that's letting you know that's, that's, that's luring you in to like, there must be some fundamental geometric pattern that all this geometry is emerging from including the fractal nature of nature and all this. Yeah. 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 Great. That's a great explanation. Good intro to that. Yeah. Very fundamental to the exploration through the course. Yeah. And they, and yeah. And, and, and these guys were on it. Like all these guys we just talked about. They, yes, that's right. Going way back. Yeah. Going and then they got kind of forgotten for a while. So right. Bringing it back. <laughs> Yeah. which you know sounds like thinking differently now but it's actually uh has a yeah. deep historical roots right so, exactly. how about how about we just uh, touch into the principles of thinking differently um you know which are very kind of foundational to our invitation in approaching this course and coming into the unified physics model um and how how it's been informing your approach for all these decades mm -hmm. um and just do that for a few minutes and then we can start taking some questions. And yeah. So the, the, first, the first one is question everything. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just read them. Question everything, intuitive knowing, follow the breadcrumbs, confirmations from nature, the solutions are always beautiful. These are the core principles. Yeah, so let's start with the last one. So if you were confronted with two models for the solar system, right? Like like at the time of Galileo and, and those guys and Bruno, um, if you, you looked at both and you said, okay, well, you know, um, they both give the right answer. Right? And, uh, so which one is the correct one? Um, there's, there's an Alcum Razor's, you know, solution to that is that most likely the most simple you know, the solar system that doesn't look like a bad hair day, basically, right? Like the one that's more simple, more elegant, and you could say more beautiful. So there's a sense of beauty, right? There's a sense of beauty. You can even see it in nature, like plants, you know, trees, like all, all the flowers, all this stuff. There's a sense of beauty. Um, 
meaning that like the universe uses very specific ratios, which happens to be, you know, the golden mean ratio to like describe, to, to fractalize all of this existence we see around us. And it puts the right colors, you know, the, the colors that go together, together, you know, like everything is like harmonious, beautiful. And, 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 um, and so there's a sense of beauty and simplicity that should be there, right? And if it's correct, then that should kind of emerge. It should be beautiful and simple. And, then, and it, it, it always boggled my mind in, in the last you know, 30 years when I would confront some, um, some skepticism and 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 the and the comments were coming back like it's too simple. <laughs> and I would be like, well, that makes it true. <laughs> that makes it beautiful. That makes it what it should be. Uh, of course, it's simple. It's correct. <laughs> it is the correct answer. Um, and um, and so <clears throat> and although it didn't have the full answer. At the time, it still, you know, was like an inkling. Well, it gives the right answer, and it's simple, beautiful. There must be something there. So, you know, so questioning everything means that, like, you you need to be in this mode where you're not just accepting the information that's being sent to you, but you're questioning it with an open mind, uh, whether it is questioning the mainstream or the mainstream questioning you, you know, like in either case, you know, basically you have to like look at it and say, well, you know, evaluate it, um, you know, based on its merits. And so, so to question it, not just accepting is part of thinking differently, is part of breaking out that, you know, outside the box. And then intuitive knowing is critical to you know to to knowledge critical thinking requires that you are actually monitoring your feelings about how you, you, uh, about what you're studying what you're thinking like this is this is important you know like your feelings are not just um um you know random things you're, if, if, the, if you're part of the universe and the universe is beautiful and it has fundamental truth in it um, that you emerge from, then you will have an emotional response to the truth. You will have an emotional response to something that's more coherent along where it should go and, and things that are less coherent towards where it, and And because that has been stripped, from students in science, we don't have so many Einsteins and we don't have so many Plancks and we don't, you, you know, like not because people are not intelligent, not because people cannot, you know, think at that level of genius and being genius, it doesn't come from analytical only. Genius comes from having a whole view, a, a wholeness to their, um, to their views, to their understanding, and that's really critical. I was going to say I was going to answer shortly, but um, then of course you got to follow the breadcrumb and like go along and um, and uh, and look for confirmation in nature, and that's what I did mostly in my earlier years, you know. And I got a lot of confirmation in nature from where I was going, and and now it's emerging at like what I've written with. Olivier in the last month and a half is remarkable. And, you know, the holographic mass solution uh, almost um, eight years ago was, was, uh, was very, very, very strong and predictive and is now confirmed. So like, it, 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 you know, with measurement in laboratory in, in accelerators, which is more than what string theory can claim, right? Like there's absolutely no evidence of string theory you know, in any way, shape, or form, that has been observed in laboratory. It, the theory itself, you know, predicts that it cannot be measured at that scale. So it's it's convenient, but you know, it doesn't make it um, 
you know, practical for, for and I, I think parts of, of string theory is, is correct. It's just missed a few turns and, and mm. be rectified. Yeah. Mm. I remember when quantum gravity and the holographic mass came out and uh, some of the feedback you were getting was basically like, well, it doesn't have this and it doesn't have that in it and it's missing all these things. So it can't be right, basically. Right. Uh, because it's such a simple, elegant algebraic and geometric solution that unless uh, a scientist was willing to, to see it for what it was without trying to look for what they were expecting or felt, right. felt was needed, right. uh, they couldn't bridge that thinking differently. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So there's a, yeah. there's a question here um, specific to kind of what, what we're just talking about um, with that one is that it's from an anonymous attendee and it says, what is happening in our brain, like with the brain waves and frequencies in the field, when we think differently, what's really happening in space memory, uh, which may be a new term for some people here, mm -hmm. uh, which you'll get familiar with later in the course, space memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and like when David Bohm says, the ability to perceive or think differently is more important than the knowledge gained. Mm -hmm. So what is, ha what is happening when we think differently in our brains, in the field? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't, I, you know, I would love to have measurements, um, you know, and, and there is measurements out there, but it's not my field of expertise. Um, what happens in the brain in terms of like changes in electromagnetic, uh, fluctuations in the brain and all this but for me from my from my experience the way i experience my brain when i think um in that state when i'm in that state which for me is kind of most of the time because that's all i do uh, but um basically um it, it feels first of all it feels like you're brain like just just like from the sensation is is firing from all side meaning there's no you, you feel first of all you feel a strong division here but 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 both hemispheres are 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 unified and it's firing like it's very much balance in there um and um it really really uh produce a sense of calm um, and, 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 um, and as well like a, an emotional state that is like open and, um, and very, very uh, specific, meaning that you, it, it seems like your senses are, are widened, that your senses are sharpened and, and, they, and that um, you have a better like sense of awareness, like you, you become very sensitive, you know, to all of the environment in which you are. And then all of it, it's like you're seeing the unseen, you're feeling the un, you know, the unseen. And, and you're, you're, um, you're kind of like just open to receiving. And what's happening in the, um, in the space memory network um, is that the information that's imprinted on the structure of space is is non-local, meaning that you know your um, your spiral that you've imprinted information on the structure of space, right? The the timeline of your existence, which is really just information on the structure of space as you move through space, um, that timeline, um, like in the moment in which you are, that timeline is connected to your mom and dad and connected backwards and backwards and backwards. And you could like go through the whole fractal nature of it all the way back to, you know, the universe. And so you're basically, you know, opening the door in that state to actually, um, extract information from the you know space memory network that the geometry of space um is is allowed 
it, it all of a sudden you're tuning into its whole to its wholeness and from that wholeness you know specific information starts to enter your consciousness enter your um your level your awareness and 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 that right so so it's like a tuning into the field it's like you took the antenna of your body and you tuned it to the to the radio station of the universe and uh and and now you're you're like doo -doo 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 -doo. you're like <laughs> you're getting you know the the radio station information right of the universe and it's not a football game that's playing on that radio station it's not <laughs> you know it, it it's it's very deep it's very fundamental and it's not necessarily uh explicit meaning that like you're most likely gonna feel it first and then you know you're, you're gonna feel it first and then you're gonna start intellectualizing you you feel it and you know what like okay i can see you know it would be this and it would be that and it would work that way that and you're following that feeling and you you're you're actually defining the dynamics and the visuals and the the understanding of that feeling as you're doing it and it might be expressed in a painting right it might be a painting it might it might be you know a a, a song it might be in, basically what i'm describing is the creative process mm. that you know that one enters when one you know it is like playing at the highest level of the symphony you know so you, you have different levels but if you're if you're wanting to like be the most accurate you know expression of that process then then you know you have to tune to the whole universe exactly yeah and uh the last section is um is uh changing course from 2d isolation to holographic wholeness and it really uh i think what you described is that shift where we we kind of turn on what i refer to as holographic thinking which is a different mode of thinking in, in and of itself it's not a linear logical sequence it certainly incorporates that right but it also is like the synergy of all that comes together in something that is actually gets to be a little difficult to just put in a linear set of words. Right. Um, and it takes a certain combination of intuition and logic combined to, to get into a state of holographic thinking, which I actually do, like you said, I believe it changes the way our brain is functioning. Uh, right, you can feel it. You yeah. You can actually feel it, yes. Yeah, you can feel it. And I think there's a change of electrical potential in the brain that happens. I know that when they measured mine, it was one, um, mm -hmm. but you know, this, um, this as well is like, so, so you can see it, you know, in those module, because we say modern physics 2D uh, isolation, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. unified physics holographic wholeness, right? Uh, basically the 2D uh, isolation is what I, what is meant there is that we, we reduce the the information to a two-dimensional structure um, in the mathematics so that we can simplify the equation and make models but then but then we forget we've done that and so what happens is that we arrive at something that actually is really true because i'm going to say another thing there because we're part of the universe and because it's holographic and because it's fractal, um, it will, you know, no matter how wrong our, our, our theories are, right? They will eventually converge towards the truth. They don't have a choice. They, they, they can't go completely outside the universe. There's no outside like this, you know, you're it's gonna the universe will make it like the math everything is gonna converge it, it, it will 
And, but if you have the wrong model, when you converge toward the truth, you might end up with something that doesn't quite make sense anymore. Meaning you, um, you might end up with like a holographic solution or a holographic principle, which is in the standard model, where you think, oh, wow, well, the universe could be a 3D projection of a 2D surface, right? That like the universe is like a, a projection of a 2D surface that englobes our universe, that in you know that our universe is in. And it's like, wait a minute, you got the 2D surface because you made a model in which you road math on 2D surfaces. That doesn't mean there's two-dimensional surfaces in the universe. Never mind a two-dimensional surface that produces a three-dimensional space. That you know, the, the the universe, it's not because you made a model with Cartesian planes, you know, and Euclidean planes, that the universe is doing that. You gotta think universe. So the the and so you have to consider the volume, not just the surface uh, in the holographic principle. And that's what led me to the holographic mass solution, mm. which, you know, I had come from a different angle to the holographic principle and ended up with the holographic mass solution because I was coming from geometry. Mm. And so that was clear to me. You can't just, you know, linearize to a two dimensional plane and assume you're going to get the right answer. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's a great example of uh, the, when there's a limited model that has a certain range of application and can solve problems mm -hmm. that then becomes codified as the model. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a discovery of, wow, there's this whole holographic nature that uh, clearly, you know, is something beyond that model yet is tried to be forced into that model. And of mm. course, you know, we've been able to make what we call two dimensional holograms, they look flat. We know they're not actually not <laughs> because there's atoms and molecules that are interacting with light waves that are very much three dimensional. But the, but the model again is, is dictating the thought. And right. that's where, you know, you said it's converging to the right in the right direction, but then it stops, it gets limited by its own set of definition of what Exactly. Is, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, it, yeah. and it, it, it's okay to define, you know, you know, boundary conditions or whatever. But right. it, it, it's not okay to forget that you've made a model, exactly. and and then when you get to that place, going, wait a minute, you know, the universe is clearly not making two dimensional planes. There's no two dimensional planes anywhere in the universe. It would require there's a plane that there's a plane that has no thickness, you know, or infinite, uh, like, yeah. And Boundaryless infinity. Yeah, infinity. yeah. and so yeah. the universe doesn't do that. So clearly, you know, that's a concept in our minds, right? And so, okay, it's practical for mathematics, it's practical for physics, but we have to manipulate these mathematics and physics so that they actually, you know, give us the correct, um, solution at the end, we can't forget, you know, so if, if, if we do a two dimensional plane, then we, we can't assume that the volume is irrelevant. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This, you can't know, cast that, it aside when, yeah. Yeah. That's actually what's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's volume. One of the questions is just so fundamental to this entire course and your theory, uh, the premise of it all, which is, you know, what is resonance science? You know, that's, that's the question. What is, what does that mean? What is resonance science? Because this is a um, the foundational idea to uh, the theory and to the model that we're exploring. Um, so maybe you could just speak a little bit to that and even how that idea is a different way of thinking from what has been established so far. 
Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I missed a question. Yeah. So the question is a simple one. What does resonance science mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So basically, um, reson um, resonance science mean that um, there is a fundamental harmonic relationships in the universe that are like the music of the spheres, if you'd like, you know, if we want to go back to, to Pythagoras and Plato and so on. And, um, and that this fundamental musical functions um, uh, is, is more resonating functions are fundamental to how, you know, the universe functions. So, so resonance science is basically the science of the fundamental principles of the universe, like the relationship between basically the universe makes ratios. And now out of these ratios emerges the dynamics uh, that we see in our reality. Um, it, the relationship of different scales, for instance, or important ratios, that the relationship of different densities are very important ratios. They produce forces. These forces, you know, we um, are things that we see as, um, you know, gravitational force, electromagnetic force, the strong, the weak force. So these things, um, so all of these are dynamic of a, of a, of a, of a universe in, um, in a harmonic relationship, in racial relationship, in geometric relationship that you could describe generally as a resonating universe or, you know, resonant science. Yeah. Yeah. That's the interaction of wave forms, which everything is mm -hmm. vibratory waveforms. Mm -hmm. that come into patterns that can be identified mm -hmm. as geometries and harmonic ratios. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so from your perspective, uh, how is that um, way of thinking differently informing uh, the pursuit of physics and science? Um, well, it's, um, it, it's required to be able to move forward, you know, from any paradigm from which you're in, you know, you will not move forward by continuing to think the same way that all your predecessors thought. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you will arrive at the same place or you might be able to move it a little bit forward, you know, in very little limited ways. But think about it. Like since Einstein, Planck, you know, Heisenberg, you know, like some of the, the big guys, right? The big guns of like the beginning of the 19th century, right? Not much has, you know, Einstein, all this, not much has changed in physics. Yes, I mean, of course, modern physics has, the, you know, the standard model, the particle model, all this stuff, but the principles, you know, I, like we're still, there's not been, there's not been other Einsteins, either other Planck's, other, you know, Eisenberg, like the, there's been some, you know, pretty good advancement, you know, we had like Feynman, we had, you know, Hawking, things like that. But, you know, something that changed fundamentally, the, these other guys really advanced what was already there, but okay, something that something like fundamental like discovery that changed our understanding of the universe is not happen. And because uh, you know the tendency has been to like the educational system has got really good at like getting everybody to think the same way, and you know so in a sense to like go to the next level is going to require to think differently, then there's not that many people that think differently. And, um, 
and that's a problem. Um, and the ones that do are typically discouraged from doing it uh, because it goes against what is being taught. And so it's very difficult in the context of our uh, structure to evolve um, a, a new level of physics. Hmm. So it, it most likely going to come from independent, right? You know, initially. Meaning, yeah. yeah, initially. Yeah. yeah. Would you would you say there you're seeing thinking differently, like we're discussing, um, coming from more sources in both independent and maybe even more mainstream science? Uh, yeah, I mean, independents are going to push it forward. I saw in the questions, there were somebody asking about Wolfram, you know, yeah. and some of the stuff he's published. Um, yeah, it's very congruent with what I'm writing right now, um, actually. Um, you know, it's not new. He, he, he published a large book on fractal physics, um, you know, years ago. I remember reading a good portion of it. Um, and uh, he, I, he was definitely on, in the right direction. But then again, you know, um, um, uh, Wolfram had to publish it, you know, as an independent because it's um, so difficult to like um, even get physicists, general, general physics to, to explore the idea of a fractal universe. Um, and using fractal mathematics um, in uh, description of space-time. Many have tried and, uh, you know, many have failed. Um, and, and so this is, um, and actually I was working on the fractal equation uh, yesterday with Olivier uh, that emerged naturally from the physics we're writing. And so I think that, uh, it's going to match nicely with what uh, Stephen is writing these days and, uh, and what he just published. Um, from what I studied of what he just published, it's very interesting and it's missing pieces that, um, you know, have to do with the hard physics of, you know, being able to make very precise, um, you know, uh, mathematical, uh, 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 extrapolation of the theory to measured values. And that's really, really important. And that's present in our physics, you know, uh, meaning like we're able to output all of the cons, well, most of the physics constant that are significant in physics. And, you know, the, the, the masses, the radiuses, you know, of all the objects, you know, including subatomic particle, the weak force, the strong force, it all comes out. So that's very powerful in that way. Mm -hmm. Another uh, sort of a camp, you might say, of thinking differently is the electric universe model, which is really posing very compelling arguments about how the electrical nature, ultimately the electromagnetic nature of energy dynamics can uh, better describe what a star is, how solar activity works, the interaction between stars and galaxies, the formation of stars. You mm -hmm. know, it's a, it's a, I think it's a very robust model that uh, yeah. I know you, you and I would agree has its limitations. Right. Uh, you know, everything has its limitations. So yeah. that's okay. Um, I think it's important. <laughs> It, it's robust. It's robust. Um, it's robust in, independently um, uh, of the formalism, meaning it's robust in its logic and its observation, right? Um, in its formalism, it's not being flushed out. That's my, you know, that's been uh, the problem that my critic of of it. Um, you know, and, um, and so basically, and, uh, and as a result, because the formalism has not been flushed out, meaning there's no real mathematical framework from which you can say, okay, here's the electric universe concept in mathematics, right? 
um, then um, I, you see, because when you have a like when you have an intuition and you have a feeling about something, it might be true, but when you actually act, um, flush out the formalism, then it start the formalism starts to show you details uh, that like you hadn't thought of before, and and as it shows you, it leads you right towards something, and and so I think you know what's misunderstood between the work I've done and the electric universe is that uh, in the case of the electric universe, so I talk about black holes and gravity and the electric universe guys are allergic to those. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and what's not understood by them is that I, in my equation, it's described as electromagnetic fluctuations of the structure of the vacuum. So I'm actually on their side. I'm actually proving the electrical, you know, base of the universe, right? Yeah. Um, but it's not being understood by them because they they don't have the formalism. So they they and I believe if they wrote it, they would end up at the same place, right? This is a fundamental electromagnetic fluctuation of space that is the source of everything. And you can explain a lot of the natural phenomena with it. I think that um, what's why it's complementary is because you are providing the foundational source, the physics of the source of electricity, the source of magnetism, mm -hmm. and they're looking at more of the dynamics that we can see at play and helping to describe those dynamics on, you know. Uh, solar mm -hmm. and galactic and cosmological scales mm -hmm. uh, without necessarily describing the source. And when you put them together, you yeah. know, you're getting now that unified science, which is right. what this course is about, really taking shape and what Wolfram's saying and others now right. all converging, like you said, into the same right. place. We're converging towards, towards the truth from many different angles. And that's very exciting for humanity because like, we're talking about we're talking about flushing out these you know formalism and as a result it's like all of a sudden like you have direct path to engineering the vacuum so that you can extract massive amount of energy you can produce gravitational drives you can do all kinds of things you can communicate across the universe you can you can you know, beam, beam me up, Scotty becomes possible, right? Like <laughs> yeah. things like that, you know, yeah. is, and, and you would expect it because typically it's in, it's in science fiction be, before it's in, you know, science right. fact. Which science fiction is a great example of thinking differently. Exactly. <laughs> without having to necessarily prove it. Right. But, you know, look at Arthur C. Clarke who predicted satellites and so yeah. many things that became reality not long after yeah yeah and and uh you know um the submarine the, the you know your cell phone all these things were predicted um Jules Verne you know predicted many things in his move in his uh in his great epic adventures you know um and and all these things came through so mm -hmm. uh, what are uh, what are others? I'm just scanning here to see what would be a good next one to go to. Um, I I had one, but there's so many. Wow. <laughs> there's a question about defining uh, first life. Uh, like to know the plan voxel is the plan. Yeah, there's, there's one here in regards to um <laughs> there's somebody <laughs> that's asking if if the Planck voxel the is a is just a mathematical abstraction or it's a true oscillation uh, that my yeah. my theory proves that it's a it's not just a mathematical abstraction. Well, why don't you take a moment to describe for people who are brand new to this course what a Planck voxel is and how it's <laughs> how it's uh, foundation. Yeah so, I, yeah, so I was saying that space-time is granular. It's not smooth. Like, 
at the cosmological level, Einstein was correct. It appears smooth, but actually when you look into it detail, it's actually granular and it's made out of electromagnetic oscillation in the structure of space. Like, uh, like you know, just like there is radio waves, there's X-ray, there's infrared in the space around you right now, you don't feel it. Well, there's oscillation that are occurring at billions of times smaller than the atom. There are little Planck oscillators that are actually the source of mass and charge and all, all of reality emerge from this fundamental field. And, um, and I got all my equations from describing the relationship of what's going on in that field. And it gives the right answer for the radius of the proton, the radius of the uh, the mass of the proton, the radius and the mass of the universe, the temperature of the universe now, all the scales in between now, like it gives all like the constants and all this. So basically all this proves that it's really there. It's not, you know, that space time is really granular and it's granular at the Planck scale and using the scaling law that we just found, you know, with this holographic mass solution, um, we were able to go sub Planck. So now we know actually there's things that are under Planck. So the, the Planck is so small. It's like if I grew a plant, Planck to a grain of sand, then the distance between this, our star, the sun, and, and Alpha Centauri would be the proton. So how, that's how small the Planck is. Well, we found on our scaling law now a sub Planck, and the sub Planck is the same distance from the Planck than the Planck to the universe. So you can imagine, you know, there's vastly finer scales. And it was, as I was uh, saying last year, uh, I think last call uh, was, was, uh, was I, I found interesting that when I was discussing this with the Dalai Lama, he said, oh yeah, we have space particle is part of our doctrine. Oh, and we have something even more subtle which I, you know, thought must be the subplanck, which we, which we think of as conscious particle. And when we calculated the speed of the subplanck, we found that it's going at 10 to the 40 times faster than the speed of light, which, you know, is not just a random number. That number is very specific to all the scales in our universe, for instance, the, the relationship, the radius, the proton to the universe, the relationship of the strong force with the gravitational force and so on. And, uh, and so you could even think of that as the speed of thought, um, you know, uh, and, um, and the, spe the speed of, uh, of, uh, of entanglement of the system in the universe, the, the speed at which the information moved through the entangled, you know, space memory network. Uh, so the speed of thought, you know, you know. One of the questions was asking about um, the standard model and, and any model, uh, really, mm -hmm. including consciousness in the model, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, the definition of consciousness is where that such a inclusion would begin, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet we're talking about in a physics model, um, you know, like you're just describing, this is the speed of thought and mm -hmm. uh, what and so that's a, another different way of thinking about not only the, the physics, but also the mind and consciousness and the unification of those, which of course, David Bohm was a, a total adherent to the unification of mind and matter. Right, uh, one of the greatest physicists. Uh, absolutely. Point, point of diversions we could have had. Absolutely, yeah, he really got it. He understood yeah. it and uh, he was, he was going up against major barriers and he persevered and said amazing things and really laid a great foundation yeah so um yeah and so in, in unified physics and maybe <laughs> even somewhat starting to happen in the standard model or maybe mainstream physics is a willingness to have an inclusion of mind and consciousness in the model right which is very very recent like when i was going to physics conferences 20 years ago, if you said the C word, you were in <laughs> deep, deep trouble. You know, you could say the F word all you wanted, but <laughs> if you said the C word, 
it was really bad. You know, now you are not going to stick around. If you talked about consciousness in a physics conference, it just didn't happen. And now it's becoming more and more accepted. And actually, it's the new thing that physicists retire and work on consciousness. Um, you know, they probably worked on, on it in the closet for many, many years. And now, you know, it's out of the closet. We can talk about consciousness and physics. And, um, and uh, basically, what happened is, um, you know, people are looking for the source of what we call awareness. But the, there's a lot of the, the sad part, part is that there's a lot of confusion and um you know but that you would expect from the level of consciousness of the humans <laughs> i'm sorry i just had to say that um but um you know the uh, the the consciousness is um a part it, so relative to the standard model people have a tendency to think that because there's a certain interpretation of the double slit experiment. It proves that consciousness has to be involved. I just want to like, you know, set the record straight. There's nothing in the standard model that says that consciousness is involved in the double slit experiment. You know, the, absolutely nothing. This just says that there's a measurement. The measurement could be done by anything, you know, uh, anything at all. Um, it could be a computer that's making a measurement with no humans around, um, you know, and it could be it, it, um, the, the mathematics does not require consciousness to be present for the wave uh, function to collapse. It, it, it just means that there's a frame of reference. So this, you know, that can be the universe, can be anything. And what comes out can be anything. It's not driven by an intent in, in this model, in their model. The double slit experiment can be explained completely differently. And that's becoming more and more popular. It's called um, uh, um, pilot, call wave. pilot wave. Yeah, pilot wave theory. Sorry, yeah. thank you. And, um, you know, I'm having senior moments. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and it will, it, it this, and I came to the same conclusion a long time ago, 25 years ago, and I didn't realize that, you know, somebody had already come up with it, like the Boglier and Bohm. Uh, but but um, basically, you can describe exactly the same thing that happens in the double state experiment if you don't assume that the particles you're shooting at the slits are in a field free environment. If you realize, no, the particles you're sending, are actually interacting with the field. So when they move, they make waves. So it's normal, it's a particle and a wave. It's not that it's some kind of like quantum, you know, magic. It's just the mechanics of a particle interacting with the field. And, 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 and then of course, if you put an object of measurement in the field or a human or whatever you want in the field, you're gonna disturb the wave interaction of that field because the object is making waves itself. And if, the, and if the object, which has to be tuned to the size of the slit, are in the right frequency, it will interfere with the, the experiment. And you will think that because you made a measurement, the experiment has changed. The fact is, is that it's all fluid dynamics that you're playing with. And you can, and, and MIT and other um, uh, uh, universities you know, put like fluids and backs and shot beads and got the same answers as a double slit experiment. So mm -hmm. it's fluid dynamics. But what does it mean about consciousness? What it means about consciousness is that actually everything is modifying everything because we're all baiting in the same field. And so it's much more interesting that way. You know, it yes. means that everything is changing everything. Everything is connected through this interaction of the fields. And, and, and this field is not just like a liquid, it's like a, it's like a, a liquid that is like permeated with wormholes, meaning it's, it's all like um, entangled. It's like a, a, a web of entanglement. Uh, and so everything is, 
informing everything else in the field and everything is being modified by the field. And that's mm -hmm. really, really important. It's very large distinction. It's a long answer. I'm sorry, but you're asking mm -hmm. a fundamental question about consciousness. So it's all it, good. No need yeah. to be sorry about that one. That's a great one. Very, very foundational to yeah. uh, the unification of this model. Yeah. Um, let's just do a couple more, Nassim, uh, okay. before we wrap up. And one is about thinking differently about time. I, I've lost track of where it is in the list, so I can't say who it was, but um, you know, questioning, well, time is fundamental to the 4D model of space-time. Um, and uh, how do we think differently about time? And, wow, uh, that's we really... do that. So yeah. maybe just nutshell that, because I know we're going to go a lot deeper into that in module four. Right. So we can just nutshell it for now and then yeah, do okay. one more question. Yeah. yeah. So in, the nut in a nutshell, think about time. I mean, you're sitting there thinking about time, and I was, you know, and thinking, okay, wait a minute, like, okay, we have space time, but what the hell is time? Mm. You know, who's ticking? Like, how is, <laughs> you know, what's ticking? Where is it ticking? Like, how, you know, and so it's like, okay, well, you know, what is time? Well, Time is a concept of humans that see an evolution, right? We see an evolution in time, right? We see an evolution in time. We see this event happened and then this event and then this event and then this event and then this event. And we assume that there's some kind of like linear relationship, right? Because we see it, we see a linear relationship, a narrow of time. And we say, oh, that is time. Well, Okay, but is that true? Well, you know, you could think of it that like, if you had no memory, there would be no time, right? So that, so, so if you if you only remember, if you can only cognitively be present to the present, right? Then you you would be there would be no idea that there was a present just before. And you would have no idea that there is a linear concept of time or evolution. Everything would be brand new every, every you know, like it would just be brand new all the time, right? So, it, it, so, so, um, so I realize a more fundamental concept of time is memory, meaning if there's time in the universe, if there's evolution in the universe, if if evolution happens because a set of information is known and then a step forward is taken from that known set of information, then they must be memory. And so it would be more precise to describe time as a memory function of space, right? Instead of thinking of time as some kind of esoteric thing that is, you know, going in, some evolutionary path nobody even knows why right mm. so basically each bit of information on the structure of space is producing a memory imprint that gives us a notion of time mm -hmm. great wow very good succinct summation of that and it's a and it's a it's a physical phenomenon you know it's this is in the physics itself Right, yeah. and exactly. that's an important aspect that it's a it's a function within the physical universe. Yeah, that it enables what we as consciousness experiencing it, uh, right, relate to as time. We call yeah, this and memory. Time. So like and when memory, we look yeah. for memory in our brain, right. we can't find it because it's not in the brain. The brain is accessing information that's on the structure of space, which is entangled into the now moment always. That's right. So there's and past, present, future is that's another abstract yeah. framework that is not absolute. So right. Yeah. So yeah. so you get you've left information on the structure of space that you are entangled with. So that is what you call your memory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, that's great. And and, uh, and makes you sense. Access it. <laughs> right. You access it, but when you access it, you change it as well. Which. Yes. You know, because you change your mind about an event, how it felt and what you felt about it and all that. 
and now that's changing your future. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, which can... that, the the yeah. evolutionary path of all those frames are changing. And we can see how it can be dynamically reorganized, or shall we say, or reimagined, or re right. whatever that changes something from the past imprinting that might be carried us in us in the present that we we formulate and that changes our relationship to present and future right exactly yeah. we'll, we'll go into that more in a later yeah. module i'm sure right. um and i think for the last question is um a couple of people have been referring to this this really potent time we're in with this pandemic this everybody having to stay where they are which is really bringing up a tremendous amount of questions really you know in terms of questioning everything and thinking differently there i think is uh, was suggested in one of the questions and I, I agree that there's a there's a great magnitude of people in the world just questioning what is going on and why is it going on? And there's equally as many theories about that right, right, <laughs> going right. on. Yeah. And but in terms of just but at least thing, people are questioning. So and that's, that's the point. And that's in terms of this this part of this course, thinking differently. Right. It does seem like there's a very powerful moment of activating that and questioning everything going on. Right. And maybe you could just as a closing for this part of this discussion give some of your thoughts around your reflections around that aspect of what's occurring and how, how that may in fact be so important right now for making a shift in the world that, that enables thinking differently or is based on thinking differently. Right. I, well, you know, I think there's many different layers to this, but I, we are in a very, you know, like this, this, this time. So first of all, it, it, there's a there's a great thing to be conscious of is that look at your life right remember your memories right and your events are like in the structure of space time and and basically look at your life and you will see that most of the time that you've made great strides in your evolution and your understanding and your level of wisdom and all this happened most likely because you had a difficult event kind of like happen that like you know you got your heart broken you like you know you 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 were trying to walk and you fell a bunch of times and you know but you persevered and you you, you learned to walk you know there's there's been difficult moments that have brought you new level of awareness new interpretation of the past even if it's the past like two seconds ago Right, like you know, whatever happened to you is in the past. You know, whatever that event was, well, you interpreted that event a little differently, which allowed you to move forward. Like all of a sudden, you 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 got a different view of the field, and what's happening from this? So globally, we have an event that's not that wonderful. You know, people getting sick. People dying, you know, is not that great. You know, our like our fathers, our grandfathers, you know, I mean, these are precious people, you know, and all this. And so, like, that is not great. At the same time, this is an opportunity, you know, and it, it, not that you lose empathy for the terrible, you know, experience that people are having. It's just that there is an opportunity to grow, you know, that that will that will you know definitely uh make all the suffering worth it if if the world can go to the to a new level of awareness and understanding as a result of this suffering then then it makes it you know it doesn't make it great because i think we could have got that without the suffering but this this is this is the or at least less you know this is the path we choose okay so here we are and and so to know that like okay yeah it's terrible and at the same time this is an opportunity is really important and then the other thing 
is that this opportunity basically is that it's 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 exposing all of the things in our society that are not necessarily very appropriate or coherent. It's making people become aware, wait a minute, like, you know, because when you're busy on the treadmill, you know, going to work and the kids and the laundry and the food and all this stuff, you don't have time to like sit there and start studying like how, I don't know, how the uh, medical and pharma structure, you know, bring certain, you know, medication or vaccination into the world or, you know, what are the statistics? How does that like work out? You know, like who's in charge? Who's paying what to who? You know, like, you know, uh, and that was a pawn on who, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> that just got their funding cut off. And, and, and you know, this, this, is, um, this is like really important. I think people are realizing, right? I, people are realizing wait a minute, and, 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 you know, and even heads of states, you know, are, are like, everybody is going, wait a minute, like, this, like, for instance, this, this shut off of the financing of who, you know, yesterday, of, of the, of the World um, Health Organization is a very, you know, bold sta step, you know, in, um, you know, maybe, Maybe a head of state going, wait a minute, you know, a head of, of a country going, wait a minute, oh, what are we doing with this? And where are we going with this? Um, you know, is that the right direction? And maybe we should assess this. And, you know, everybody knows I'm not a big fan of the guy. I, you know, everybody has his qualities and, and not, you know, I, I, and I'm glad um that he's taking that stand to say wait a minute because um you know if you look at the if you look at the you know some of these institutions have made very public you know their willing you know their agenda their willingness like you know and then people are starting to see this because otherwise they won't they wouldn't have time to see this right so so now they're starting to say oh look you know, the Gates Foundation, like the second larger donor to who, you know, and, you know, wow, look, they, they're pushing vaccine in the world. Everyone, everybody needs to be vaccinated. You know, like all these things are like, and then it's like, oh, look, there's a certain agenda, right? You know, all of a sudden, like the, the who, you know, uh, uh, a projection or their intent for, for the next, you know, 10 years becomes, you know, we want like all of vaccination of every human on earth. And, you know, because they're funders, like one letter is funder, you know, and so on. And so now you start to see how that all works and where it's going and people, and, and it opens your eyes. And then, you know, people, are like, oh, okay, um, I, you know, I have different thoughts. Have, and, then, and so all of a sudden, it's like a layer peels off. And, the, and, and now you're, you have the opportunity to think differently. All of a sudden, it's like, okay, you know, this is not necessarily where I, where I want to go. This is not necessarily the world I want right what do i do what am i doing in my life that's going in that direction you know do i want more you know bioengineering do, do i want more you know like what are we supporting how are we you know globally interacting with this and so the, this opportunity to open the eyes of all of the people and i'm not talking about um you know, about um, uh, uh, conspiration, conspiracy theory and all this. I'm just talking about looking at the facts and making your own conclusion. This opportunity is there. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's there and it, it's becoming more and more clear. It's easier to, to, to see it. And the result is like an opportunity for the world to take a different course than, you know, self-destruction, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Important to think differently in light of that prospect. <laughs> right. <For sure. laughs> right. Yeah. And to, well. bring, and to bring our, our energy, to bring our intent, to bring our, you know, our participation in making it different than where it was going. Yeah. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so like, it's not just realizing it, but like get involved, you know, do what's required to get it to move in that new direction, you know, yeah don't intend in going back to business as usual right, right? Yeah. no that had some big problems already <laughs> right exactly sure. exactly so keep those lights on keep the you know keep the shutters open keep mm -hmm. you know digging you know investigating and stay open and 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 let your knowing you know uh lead you yeah, beautiful. Wow, that's beautifully said. You know, this really um, conveys the importance of why we made this module too, thinking differently. Because at times in the evolution of thought and the evolution of humanity, our social systems, our science, across the board, uh, it requires the courage to, to think differently, the courage to be bold, the courage to, to really stand up in the face of what's like you said, what's present, just it doesn't take much to look at the facts and see some of the things that need questioning at the very least should be questioned before mm -hmm. being enacted. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of that up right now, which is great. And that's the, that's why thinking differently, being willing to think differently mm -hmm. is so important and critical to the process at any time, but I think it's clear especially now. at this time, especially now. Yeah, yeah. Question. And the beautiful thing is that we do have uh, alternatives mm -hmm. that are based on resonance science, based on understanding the unification of all things. Right. That are very tangible. Yeah. There are technologies, there are principles, and, and that which can inform the way we structure our societies. Yeah. They're all very present and equally valid and equally available to, to understand and, and consider. Right. So that's where yeah. we're at. That's what we're doing. And yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, to come back to a more natural sense of, of unification with nature, you yeah. know, it's like, you know, guess what? If you, if you take care of your immune system and you, you know, give it the right elements and everything, and it's a happy, immune system well you're gonna just brush off this thing you know and you might get a little sniffle and a little fever and mm -hmm. um you'll be fine right yeah the, the, it, like there's things like that it's like wait a minute you know like have we have we really you know have we really improved you know i was looking at the death rate of our society uh, graphs yesterday. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing better, you mm -hmm. know, we, like actually the, you know, the, uh, the, ex the life expectancy is now dropping, um, yeah. you know, right. and, and so on. So uh, this is not going in the right direction, you know, what yeah, are we doing wrong? Yeah, yeah, good things to question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great, Great. well, yeah. Great. Let's leave it at that for today. That was a really uh, deep and robust exploration of thinking differently uh, today and um, the importance of it and some of the principles that we feel are important for engaging in it and certainly are relevant to these times for sure. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. thank you, Nassim, for the time today. Next week at the same time on Wednesday, we'll be back here for module three, which is modern physics. Um, and that's a very important aspect of this exploration to, to understand what the current model is, what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are, what are the big questions uh, within it still, 
within that model unanswered that are actually be, being rapidly answered through understanding the unified science model, unified physics. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll touch on that next week. Mm -hmm. uh, again, and everybody don't feel like you need to study it beforehand, but you can if you want. It's, it's a deep people, dive, that one. Yeah, people have described module three as the brick wall and, <laughs> um, you know, in certain cases. And so uh, that's where courage comes from. <laughs> yeah. the, main thing is, the main thing is just to read it and don't worry about whether you understand it all, you know. Right. Just take it all in because you're yeah. going to get something from just reading the whole thing no matter what. And mm -hmm. some of it gets a little technical, doesn't mm -hmm. matter, that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's, it's more about just getting the idea of what it's about and then how that's gonna become in relationship to the unified physics that's following it, so. Right, exactly, and, and, and things are gonna, even in the unified physics part, you know, things that you re read, you might not be able to integrate right away, but it, yep. it, it will be in there and eventually, it will it'll pop out when you least expect it sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> uh, and then you you know and then so the, the pieces kind of falls in. Just just read it like with an like an open you know uh, level of awareness and just allow it to just permeate through you. And I think you know the 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 resulting experience is that it it, it might feel fragmented. But but it will all come together, uh, you know. And exactly. You, yes. You gotta exactly. trust that. It'll percolate for yes. a while. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you, Nassim, and thank you everybody here on uh, on Zoom and on Facebook Live today for joining us for joining this this course and uh, this series. And um, we always enjoy doing this, and it's an ongoing thing that we will continue. Uh, through our subscription later and in this initial six weeks is a taste of all that's to come. Yeah, uh, you can see how rich and deep it is and what kind of great questions we get in our Q and A's. So thanks Nassim and thank you everybody. Thanks to Jamie and David and Penny again for helping us out. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you all thank next you. week. Yeah, and until next week, may the vacuum be with you <laughs> and uh, Stay safe and healthy out there. Yeah, stay safe and healthy, everybody. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.